Cool. So we started. Okay. Hey, Woody. My name is Joe Winchester. Thanks so much for um, for dialing into this talk. So I've got about 25 minutes and um, this is interesting talk um, that, uh, so I gave a talk yesterday. So I work for um, IBM. That's my email address there, winchester.uk.ibm.com. Uh, I work on open source software um, for uh, international business machines. My Twitter handle, if you look on the sort of bottom right hand corner of that, um, it talks about what I enjoy, what I, I enjoy doing outside work, you know, my family and so forth. But it says on there, um, I'm a coffee nerd. I, I like coffee. I like to always find good coffee when I go to a town. I enjoy drinking good coffee. It also says I'm an astronomy, amateur astronomy. So this is really uh, mirrors two of my passions together. Um, so uh, I've always enjoyed software and I've always enjoyed astronomy and space. So. Uh, this talk I've given it a couple of times actually at astronomy clubs, local astronomy clubs, where I tend to go and geek out. I've not actually given it at a conference before, so so bear with me and, and give give feedback if uh, if it's not what you're expecting or or you think perhaps improvements can be made next time if I give that talk. So, a um, little bit of background. Um, what I wanted to do was uh, so the talks that I like to listen to the most are ones that sort of tell a story or give me something that's slightly didactic. Um, there's something I can learn from the talk, even if it's not about something that's my area of expertise. So what I've decided to do for this talk is I want to focus on four uh, space missions, four particular space missions. They're all different um, and all of them have a story to tell about software, um, computer software in space. Okay. And the first space mission I'm going to cover is the uh, Ariane 5 rocket. Um, so background to Ariane 5. So in 1957, uh, there's a picture of planet Earth in the bottom left hand corner. Um, the, uh, Sputnik was launched. Uh, Sputnik was launched by the USSR, the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, Sputnik 1 was the first satellite in, in space. And if you look at the right hand picture on that chart, we've now got over 3000 satellites in space around Earth, uh, plus around 8000 pieces of junk, which are non operational satellites. Um, Plus, um, actually, uh, some satellites have actually, um, uh, there's been some sort of, it's a couple of satellites uh, recently were actually uh, sort of blown up um, as kind of, you know, perhaps a precursor of space warfare or, or, or things like that. And, and there's been some failures as well in space and things like that. So there's about, about 11,000 bits of stuff orbiting the Earth, of which sort of three, at least 3,000 were sort of put there by, by, by mankind. So um, Ariane 5, um, so, there was, a, there was a sort of big race uh, to try and get stuff in space, get satellites in space. They're hugely important for telecommunication systems, global positioning systems, uh, you know, the spy satellites, there's telescopes, the Hubble telescope is a very famous telescope in space in a, in, a, in, a, in a particular orbit. So there was this huge sort of race to basically have the best vehicle to get satellites into space. Uh, the space shuttle, most of us are very uh, familiar with the space shuttle, the absolutely wonderful uh, spacecraft built by NASA. Space shuttle was operational from about 1981, uh, to 2011 and it had 135 uh, five missions in space. Um, ESA is the European Space Agency and the European Space Agency around the same time sort of towards the um, you know end of the last decade also wanted to get its own kit in space as well and contribute to that sort of vast amount of satellites in space. And it was a series of rockets, Ariane, they were named the Ariane which is a, a Greek goddess, a mythical goddess and the they, they were number, numbered, so there's Ariane 3, Ariane 4, and, and, and Ariane 5. So Ariane 4 was an, and as each, each rocket was created, it basically made use of sort of advances in hardware that were coming at the time, you know, bigger rockets, they could get bigger payloads into space, um, and they could burn their engines more efficiently, so they were more fuel efficiently. Just the same way that, you know, if you go back in time, you know, modern car now, it's a much better MPG, it's much more efficient, aerodynamic cars and perhaps the same car sort of 20 years ago and 40 years ago. So you've got that same same progression between the, the Ariane 3 and the Ariane 4 and the Ariane 5. Um, Justin, I'm just going to read a few notes here. So by comparison, the Ariane 4 rocket, uh, depending on how high you want to go, whether you want to go into what's called a low Earth orbit, uh, which is where you get sort of telecommunication satellites towards a, um, you get a further orbit out where you get geostationary orbits. Uh, which basically they maintained over the same line of longitude as the Earth rotates, or there's another orbit which is about halfway between the two, which is where it goes around twice the Earth, which is where GPS satellites are. Um, 
you're basically going to get a payload of about you know seven thousand five hundred kilograms you know, up to a low Earth orbit, or perhaps four and a half thousand up to the uh, up to the middle orbit, and for the GPS orbit, it's going to be even even higher for the geostationary. So the Ariane five, pretty much, that was the Ariane four. The Ariane five came along, and it basically you got about four times the payload. So they have these huge boosters on the side, very much sort of you know model upon the kind of space shuttle model, which is where you just take extra extra rocket boosters, you know, give yourself a huge lift to get escape velocity, and then basically get into those further orbits. Ariane five, um, a decade, ten years development, cost seven billion US dollars. This is a very expensive. This, that's in real time money. So if you project that now, it's uh, it's going to um, obviously be more money. Uh, Maiden launch, June the 4th, 1996. You've got $7 billion worth of kit sitting there on the payload. And it was putting four satellites into space on its maiden launch. And I've added the word uninsured satellites. Um, so for those of you that haven't seen what happened, um, you can go to YouTube afterwards. There's some phenomenal videos of, of, of it. Um, it blew up. The rocket exploded. $7 billion worth of hardware, a, a decade of development. Just, just blew up in space. Great big firework. Nobody was hurt. A, a manned rocket. So then they forensically afterwards they say, "Why? What happened? Why on earth did this um, happen?" A little bit of background. Everybody here works in software, so most people are familiar with how numbers are stored in in, in the computer. So most of it is a binary. Binary is effectively a transistor. You know, it's, it's it's either on or off. You know, it's it's whether charged or uncharged. So you can see very quickly, you know, the number 10, for example, in binary is 1010. The 8-bit computers, it, you know, all the ones are lined up, gives you a maximum of 255. 16-bit gives you a maximum of 65,000 or 64K, as it's often shorted to. 64-bit numbers becomes much, much higher and so forth. So as, as you go through 16-bit uh, computing, 8-bit computing, 64-bit computing, and so forth, obviously the amount of the, the, the numbers that you can store just get larger, you can do more computation and you have more ability to store higher numbers. And that's the sort of progression that was occurring at around at the same point in time. Now what was unfortunate, and it's, it's important to understand how numbers are stored. What was unfortunate about the Ariane 5 rocket is it blew up, it's an absolute tragedy, it's about four, of, it's a perfect storm of things that have gone wrong. The first thing that went wrong is basically the mission failed because 39 seconds after launch, um, it's self-destructed. It's self-destructed because it realized, and perhaps I can see it if I go back, yes, I can, and it's wonderful software, I can go back in slides. If we look at the pictures here, um, it's, it's, it's going up straight and it's veering off course. It's kind of veering off course and then it blows up. So it's got enough sensors on board for it to realize it's veering, veering off course, apologies, and blow up. It did it on purpose. It's self-destructed on purpose because it thought, we're off course, this is really bad, we, you know, we might hit a populated area, you know, abort, 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 boom. And it, and it self-destructed. It blew up some explosive charges. Um, the reason it, it went off course is basically because there was a 16-bit number that was receiving telemetry information, and the, the the piece of software that was received that was transmitting the telemetry information on Ariane four, it was giving a a, a number that couldn't get higher than 16 bits. Okay, on Ariane five which was a faster rocket, the number was larger number, okay? The number was a to do with the velocity and because it was going faster, it got bigger than it had been on Ariane 4 and it went into a storage area that was only 16 bit, it overflowed and it basically it started walking over other memory and it all went pear shaped and the whole thing blew up from there. Um, and most rockets, have multiple systems, have you know, aircraft and a second system confirmed it. It went to a second system and said, this, this has gone really badly wrong. And the second system confirmed it because the second system was fed the same incorrect data. So $7 billion worth just exploded. Now, here's the awful thing. On Ariane 3, when this software was written, Removed from Ariane 3 because the developers knew that the exception could never occur. The software was ported to Ariane 4, where luckily it didn't occur, and then when it went to Ariane 5, it most definitely did occur. 
Not only that, just to make matters even worse for the poor people when they were having their kind of you know management appraisal as to why they blew up a seven billion dollars worth of rocket. Thirty nine seconds into the launch, it blew up. The software wasn't even needed because it was sideways velocity of a rocket on the launch pad. It's off the launch pad now, so it's flying out. So it's not even needed to be switched on. But they had decided, well, let's leave it running anyway until 40 seconds after launch, because just in case it's easier, because if the launch has to be launch sequence has to be aborted and then we started, it's an easy reboot sequence. So I would think, what can we learn from this? Number one, understand arithmetic. It's really important in computing to understand arithmetic. If you Google, and I did a little bit of research before this, there are many, many other examples of where people not knowing how computers store numbers has caused terrible things. There's one example I've got here, which is a Patriot missile. It's a, it's a defensive missile that, uh, that, uh, that the US Army and other armies have. And uh, there are examples where it's just completely misfired. Um, there was an example of a calculation error on, on, on Microsoft Excel that people took for granted. Um, these are both fabulous bits of hardware and software. I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying the fundamental error is, and I see this often with developers, if you don't understand how numbers are stored, if you don't understand how big things can get, how big arrays can get, and you get array overflow indicators, you can, you can cause catastrophic failures. So understand how things count. Reusing software. If you're writing a new system and you take software that was written for an older system and bring it across to the new system, you'll find that the constraints have been removed. You know, things have got bigger, the world's got faster, bandwidth has got bigger. The, the, the constraints that the developers had in the older software will no longer be relevant. You will see things getting stressed and strained at levels. As you saw with that software for Ariane 3 that was written where they took out the exception handling code, could have put it back in to Ariane 4, could have put back into Ariane 5, just simply didn't think it would go wrong. They said, well, it's prudent software, we're just gonna run it and migrate it. The next one, understanding daemons. You get that a lot with software. I see a lot of performance problems on software where things run slowly and it's because you've got heartbeats and keep alive and things sort of left running alive for more than they need to be, dynamically scanning disk for plugins that really need an activation or startup. And that happened a little bit with Ariane 5 as an analogy. It didn't need to be running this software after launch. It had already launched. It wasn't required until it launched, and it blew the thing up. Uh, it's catastrophic. The other thing, software, don't give up. Ariane 5 actually had over 100, had about 108 successful launches. So even when you've managed to explode $7 billion worth of rockets, yeah, don't give up. Okay, so that's my, <laughs> my twist. Of Next story I'd like to tell you, Saturn. So Saturn's a really interesting planet. It's... Um, second largest in our solar system, it's six away from the sun. And it's, it's a very large planet, very massive planet. It's about the radius, about nine times the radius of Earth. It's, it's, it's a gas giant. It's mostly a sort of a, a kind of helium and hydrogen atmosphere, but it's an iron nickel core. It has 62 moons, 62 named moons. That's going to be about 20 more. Now, one of them is called Titan. Uh, Titan is a really interesting because Titan is actually bigger than Mercury. Right, Mercury is one of our planets. So it's, it's large. It's a large celestial body. Um, and it's very interesting to study. Saturn is an interesting planet because Saturn actually emits about two and a half times more thermal radiation than it absorbs from the sun. It's actually a generator of heat. So it's almost like a mini, the relationship that Titan has with Saturn is almost like the planets like, you know, like Earth and, and, and you know, Mercury and Mars and Venus have with the sun in that we, it receives heat from it. And it actually has a methane atmosphere. Titan's a very interesting planet because people have been uh, pointing telescopes at Titan for, for, for a long time and you just can't see inside it. It's a very cloudy methane atmosphere. So um, Cassini Huygens um, is a really interesting uh, probe that was created. Um, it was launched in 1997. And what you've got, I'm looking at the picture of here, you've basically got a, a very big ship. It's actually nuclear powered. It's one of the first uh, ships in space that NASA created. And it had basically plutonium 238 decaying. It's a seven year mission. It did about two slingshots of Venus and one of Earth and it gets acceleration each time it comes around the planet and it doesn't quite you know, hit the planet. It gets terminal velocity and gets a little boost and it kicks around and it kicks around at seven years and it's flying off and it had, Cassini had a phenomenal uh, mission basically exploring Saturn and its moons. Now, when it gets to Titan, the European Space Agency have this wonderful thing, kind of piggybacking on, on, on the Cassini, which is called the Huygens probe. Huygens was an interesting, he was a, he was a very, very, very clever Dutch mathematician um, um, who actually discovered the rings of Saturn. 
And the idea is that as it approaches Titan to get inside the atmosphere, and these are the costs, I mean, this is the, a, a lot of money that you don't want to get wrong. Um, they basically drop it. Uh, I hit the next slide, there's a nice picture of it here. The idea behind it is you drop this thing, the unpowered, that just parachutes through the atmosphere, gets under the cloudy atmosphere, opens a parachute, all sorts of sensors and probes go on, looking, listening, you know, measuring radiation, you finally get to the bottom, take a bunch of snapshots. Now this, the, the Huygens probe doesn't have the power to transmit back to Earth, because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're seven years away, it's about five light minutes back to Earth. Um, but this bit giant Cassini uh, craft is still in space. So that's basically your, your relay ship. So Huygens, as it's going down, transmits to Cassini. Cassini then gets out, it has a two and a half meter antennae. Let me see if I can go back to the picture of it. Um, here we go. You can see it's got two and a half meters, two and a half meters, it's large, I don't know what that is in feet. It's about what, sort of nine, possibly 10 feet or something like that. Um, it's very large and that's basically, um, you know, to talking back to Earth and storing the data and, and sending it back to Earth. Okay. So, so, so you've got, you've got two transmission. You've got Huygens dropping needs to talk to Cassini and then Cassini needs to talk back to Earth. Either those two go wrong, uh, you're basically losing a lot of money. Now, this is somebody that if you ever, if you work with somebody like this, I, I work with a lot of testers and I've worked with a lot of testers in my mind. Um, and I know this is a tester. This, this person, I just want to, Kind of kiss him through my screen and give him a little bit of a hug. Boris Smith, he was a test engineer. Now, good testing means that you think of things that the, the engineers haven't thought of. You, you use software in a way that your end users haven't predicted. Um, don't test for the predictable. You know, look at how is this thing going to break in unpredictable ways. So he was bothered about the fact that they had never run a test where you drop a probe into a planet's atmosphere talk back to something else that's sort of orbiting the atmosphere, or in this case was the thing actually dropped it, but then talks back to Earth. He said, we've never tested this. It's the first time it's ever been done. I want to test. $5,000, it was all it cooked to create that test. You Google for this if you want. There's a lot of um, stories here about managers not really trusting testers, engineers being dismissive of testers, but this story is about testing software. Now the fundamental problem, I'll give a little background. Most people here will know about Doppler shift. You know, something comes towards you, it's going to dee -nee 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 -nee, and it gets loud and, you know, because as something emitting a wave is coming towards the receiver of the wave, the wave gets compressed. And when a wave gets compressed, the frequency goes up and for sound, it, you know, the pitch gets higher. For light, you know, you get red shift and blue shift and then on the backside, it goes down, the sound will go down and you're gonna get the longer, uh, the, the stretching, the, the lower frequency. Now, everybody is aware of the frequency because you can see red and blue shift light if you're looking at stars and things. And you can hear, you know, a, a police or an ambulance siren or some motorbike coming towards you and the noise being compressed. But if sound is constant and you change your frequency, you're changing your wavelength. This was the Achilles heel of the mission. So as you're dropping your probe and your separation between your Cassini and your Huygens, um, it's about six kilometers a second, okay? So that's quite high. You're looking at about three times the speed of sound or something like that. Your, your frequency is, is, is obviously affected by the Doppler shift, but so is the wavelength. And this is what basically SMEDS realized and SMEDS tested for and proved was that the, the digital sound is basically ones and zeros, it's peaks and troughs, right? So the way that you decode digital sound, the way you decode any digital signal is you have your peaks and troughs for your ones and zeros. You line it with a base signal that's sort of one, 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 one. And you just say, am I high? Am I on? Am I off? Am I on? Am I off? And then you have your binary number and you've managed to decode your digital signal. This is fundamentally how digital data is decoded. The problem is, if you think about this, it's a bit like two, two cogs meshed together and turning and saying, you know, am I on or am I off? If you sort of take a blowtorch and heat one of them up, so that the wavelength gets bigger, it's your math all goes wrong. Everything, all of your alignment is gonna go out. And that was a fundamental problem that they had. And they realized that about four years into the seven year mission. Um, they knew that the frequency was gonna change, but they didn't realize that, they, that the wavelength was gonna change. So what would you do four years into a mission? Easy, you just patch your software. 
you would just, you know, you've got three years left, you would just go, here's my fix. I'm, this was unpatchable software. They had no chance of patching this software. So the way that they had to fix it is they had to physically change the separation velocity. So they had to ditch the Huygens probe weeks ahead of when they expected. They had to decelerate Cassini. They had to do a double fly pass to decelerate this huge ship. And then they had to basically make it so that you had your separation velocity was different. And even then, 80, only 80% 80 of the signal was getting through. Um, it was actually very successful. We got some nice pictures here of, of the Huygens probe descending onto Titan and landing. So what have we learned from this? Single point of failure. If you have a single point of failure, which they had in this case, uh, try not to. So they could, have, they could have not had a single point of failure. They could have had another way to transmit data. Inability to deliver in fixes and fight. I've seen software that goes out that can't be patched. And I think it's appalling, right? If you buy something with hardware, right now we're used to patching our phones, Internet of Things, it's really important to be able to patch software. Software will break, software will get stressed. Lack of testing, this is the first time ever in space that this binary method was used and there hadn't been a lack of testing. And the other one, and I won't talk about the management stuff here if you want to Google for it, but Matt, if there's many managers on the call, listen to your testers, trust them, listen to your testers, and don't test stuff that, if the developer says, here's a manual and I built it, you almost want to trust it's going to work. Go look for the stress cases and the edge conditions where it's unlikely to work because that's where you'll find vulnerabilities. And also, that's possibly where you'll find the ability for hackers to come in and perhaps do malicious things to your software. And the third one that I loved, best way to solve a problem is to avoid it. If you're flying too fast through space and the Doppler shift is against you, and laws of physics are up against you, slow yourself down. Let's do a couple of flybys every minute. It's the most obvious chance. The next one, I've just got a few minutes left. I'm going to run up. So Mars is a wonderful planet. Mars is our sort of you know, closest, most Earth-like planet possibly. It possibly had an atmosphere, it possibly had water, possibly, who knows, had some sort of life forms on it. Um, so within the late um, 1990s, um, actually, in the early 1990s, uh, there was some quite awful, there was, a, there was a mission to Mars that got lost, and sort of NASA went back and said, we're going to do low, low-cost missions. So within 1998, there was a Mars Climate Orbiter and a Mars Polar Orbiter land that were both uh, launched to go to Mars. Okay, your climate orbit so orbits Mars. It's a satellite. It's obviously looking down, measuring it, but it's obviously to, it's talking to your polar lander, which is sitting on the pole and driving around. This is what's meant to happen. Both missions went wrong. The Mars orbiter, unfortunately, uh, the trajectory it came in at uh, was earlier, and it basically just just bounced off the atmosphere and got lost. And what's awful about this? This is a hundred and ninety million dollar mission. It's the most basic error. It's it's measuring the uh, it's measuring where it is based upon effectively the um, density of the Mars atmosphere, but there was a unit that NASA built and a unit that Lockheed Martin built, and one of them was delivering uh, metric data, uh, which is pounds per square inch, and the other one was imperial data, which is uh, you know kilograms per square meter, which is newtons, and you've got a, a difference of about four and a half, and because of that thing, it went. It's the most fundamental thing. But it comes back to knowing what your count, and I did, I did physics when I was, you know, count, but if you look at a number, know what units that number were in. And, and that was a ca catastrophic. And the second problem, because the orbiter wasn't there, when the polar lander arrived, the polar lander was unable to rely on telemetry from the orbiter to work out its height. Um, and as it was descending onto the atmosphere of Mars, um, it had a parachute. And you don't want to land and then have your parachute fall up on top of you, that's going to cover all of your instruments. And you're not going to be able to take wonderful photos of, of the atmosphere and stuff like that. So it needed to know when to jettison the parachute. And it has these legs sort of dangling beneath it that, that, that try and uh, work out how, when it touches the atmosphere. Because the orbiters got lost, if the orbiter was there, it would know exactly where it was. It would have been communicating with it. But because the orbiter disappeared um, about sort of 25 days earlier, um, then when it came down, it was it had to rely on on the on basically feelers, and the feelers unfortunately got it wrong because there was actually a storm at the time that, that basically made it think it had landed before it landed. So it jettisoned the parachute, and then it fell the last forty meters, and this is what it looks like. It's since been photographed since. It's basically just kind of in bits on the Mars surface. 
Um, so what can we learn from that? Understand your units, read your specifications, don't rely on a single force of failure, do design playbacks, pair review, talk to a brick wall, do risk assessments, do worst case planning, and anticipate, test, simulate, and my little punchline at the end, if ever anybody tells you that they haven't, uh, you know, they, can't, they won't test their software or they want to put in more features to their software rather than test what they've already got, as far as I'm concerned, in space, no one can hear your excuses. Okay, make sure what you've got works and it's proven and think about the edge conditions, okay? And most of us, I'm certainly lucky that it's a software that I write breaks, I can patch it, we don't lose millions and billions of dollars in space, but um, that's what we should do. Okay, cool. I am just gonna wrap up there. Um, I've got a couple of feedbacks, other slides available for download. Yes, they are available for download, I don't know where. Um, there's a Slack channel or else, uh, just Google for it. And um, yeah, thanks everybody very much for um, for being, being part of what uh, was my first attempt anyway to talk about doing my passions software and space. Enjoy the rest of your day. Stay safe, everyone. Bye.